I've been told by everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of Explosion 4. Got fire through the roof of the fire building in the entire rear section. Please, now remember given the payday. Has you been accounted for? Okay. 610B, now is the main date. 610B. I'm out uh, here. We got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling. Fire shown from the second floor. Give me a second alarm on this. See up there, top floor. I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke. Go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. Got people on the front fire escape here with windows sensors below them. We need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up now. Second alarm, I got a one story single family frame. Heavy fire showing from the attic. So we're using all hands. We got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor. Second line being stretched. Primary searches are underway. Welcome back to another episode of Old School. Our podcast. Uh, I'm Rick Lasky, along with my buddy John Salka, and a uh, uh, couple more good days of classes uh, since we last uh, got together for a podcast. Um, um, ha- having fun. I mean, it, it's just. I think they're dying to get back on the road. I think. I think firefighters, you know, officers, the fire services, dying to get back in the classroom. John. Right. Right. After that year or fourteen or fifteen months, whatever it was, the uh, the COVID. Uh, you know, everything was, I mean, God, the whole country was on, on hold. Everything from restaurants to sporting events to religion to, to you name it, and, and, and training. You know, all the big conferences, all the little conferences, a couple of little ones went off, but not too many, and, and, under, and under tight restrictions and, you know, spacing and all that other stuff. Uh, now it's pretty much wide open again. There's some, you know, some, some talk about a new, a new virus or a new this or a new that, but they keep saying that if, if it's going to be another pandemic, it's going to be a, a pandemic of the people that aren't vaccinated. And um, anyway, like, I, like you just said, and I agree with you 100%, I think the fire service has been waiting and yearning to get back to the streets and to get back to the conferences and to get back to the schools and, and, and start learning again. Uh, you know, some people made some efforts to do online stuff and Zoom stuff, as, as we did, uh, but there's nothing like sitting in a classroom, both both up on stage, talking to folks and, and the audience, you know, listening to us or listening to whoever they go to. So, uh, yeah, you're right. Everybody was looking forward to getting back, and they are getting back. And here we are in New Jersey doing our company officer academy, uh, uh, second or third one since we started uh, resuming them. And uh, we had a great crowd today and, 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 you know, day two tomorrow, which would be great. Uh, so I'm happy to be back, too. It's nice to get uh, nice to get out of the house, nice to sit on a plane again and, and you know, Sounds terrible. Sit in a hotel and, and, and be away for a day or two and just it's like a breath of fresh air. So I'm enjoying it. And, uh, and you are, too, I'm sure. And the students certainly enjoyed it today. Well, and people are people are tired of wearing masks and do I mean, everybody do their they did their due diligence, you know, to take care of things, to stop the spread and all that stuff. But people want to get back to a normal life again. Yep. And uh, maybe this is the reset button we needed. But yep. uh, and it's over. So, well, and, you know, one of the things. Uh, when we talk about leaving your mark in the, in the fire service, there, there are some people on the EMS side of things that we do in the fire service that stepped up. You want to talk about legacy. Some of these men and women that, that stepped up and figured out how we're supposed to respond to this whole COVID thing to, you know, the whole, you know, all right. So if, if it's not life or death, however you show up if someone's ill, you send one EMT, one paramedic in to assess the patient, stand six feet away, hand them a mask, all that stuff, to where we got even better. I mean, we really figured this stuff out. So there are some people that for decades they'll be talking about, John, what they did and how they did during COVID, you right, know. Right. Um, you and I, golly, we, we know so many people. If we just if we just spent this episode, heck, talking about legacy and, 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 and that, um, you know, and, and asking – We've had the opportunity to ask people, you know, what will be your legacy? I, I, I mentioned I mentioned the other day in class, uh, you know, that I was approached, you know, at, at, at the at the book booth once we're doing our talk and, you know, and everything else. And afterwards, uh, you know, signing some books and this this nice guy comes up. He says, yeah, I got 20 years, of, you know, in the fire service and all stuff. And I want to do about another 15 years. I really want to start working on, on leaving my legacy. And I'm like, <laughs> excuse me, I'm like, what have you been doing for 20 years? Right. You're you just going to start now? Yeah. And I talk about pride and ownership that, you know, to remind your probies, your rookies, that your legacy, you know, you began building your legacy the moment you walked in the door. Well, you, you know, know what? That, I mean, that's the point. Like, oh, he's on the job 20 years, and now he's starting to think about his legacy. And the point is, he's really not starting late. 
because it's not a decision that you make to start your legacy. It's not a decision that you make to say, oh, gee, how am I going to be remembered? However, you've been acting and working and teaching and operating and, re and, and reacting and having relationships with people, however, you've been doing that for five years or 10 years or 15 or even 20, like he just said, your, your legacy has already started to form. Leg legacy is not formed by you. It's formed by other people's impressions of you, right. what they what they remember about you from being, oh yeah, last year, he was a great instructor. He came and he taught that pride ownership stuff, pride and ownership book and a pride and ownership program and, and, and this guy and that guy and oh, Vinny Dunn, what a great, so like you could start talking about different guys and it's, and it's the perception. It's what other people think about you that you've been talking about. So obviously some folks like you and I, we have a company officer academy. I think we're well known for that. Um, and we're proud of this, it's a great program. Uh, Vinny Dunn is known, I mean, for years about burning buildings and collapse of burning buildings and now into the, you know, the firefighters battle space and things like that. Everybody's got their things. Remember John Mittendorf and all sorts of people have their, have their little corner of the fire service that they get to be known about. And some, you know, teach in different ways. Some, some teach more actively, some teach more passively. And it, it's just, and then, so, and then some guys' legacies are built on, on, on how they, were the chief, how they, how they acted and performed and, and, you know, as a chief of a fire department or, or even, you know, as, as a battalion chief, we talk about the Hoff brothers, your friends, you know, and, and, and their history in, in the fire service. So legacy is something that happens all by itself. It's how people are viewing you as you're growing up in the fire service and working and teaching and, and doing all the things that we all do. You know? Well, and it's hard to teach a class without mentioning some of the names you already mentioned, like Vinnie Dunn. I mean, so many times, you know, when, when we're doing, you know, sweat the small stuff or tactics and strategy or safety and survival of some kind, to not mention building construction, fire behavior, to not mention, well, you know, a great quote, a great lesson from, from Chief Vinny Dunn, you know, and, and I, I think you, you said it before, I think anybody sets out to leave a legacy. And that's the point. You know, exactly. you don't set out, it just develops on its own. Yeah, it happens. Like, you know, I always talk about Bill Allen. Lieutenant well, I don't, want, I don't want to get away from Vinnie Dunn first. Oh, ahead, so one more moment. Vinnie Dunn is also known, at least in the FDNY, and probably beyond the FDNY. Some other instructors know it too. Like, I went to Vinnie Dunn for advice when I was a young man, when I was a young instructor and a young writer. Like, uh, I think it was Harvey asked me to write for Firehouse or something else. And I, I went to Vinnie Dunn and said, gee, Vinnie, I need some advice. I mean, I sort of know what I'm doing now. I got a little bit of experience and I'm being asked to, to, to do some stuff. He said, oh, just, just listen get 10 topics together, not topics, but he said, pick a topic that you know about. He said, that's the first rule. It's got to be something you know a lot about. And then, and then pick 10 like sub topics or sub issues about that topic. For example, the power saw operations, you know, the different kinds of saws, the different kinds of blades, how to carry it, the depth of the cut, rolling the beams. He said, come up with 10 of them. There's your paragraphs for an article. He said, if you wanted to do a book, there's your chapters for a book. He said, it's really all pretty simple how to structure writing. He said, then the writing part of it is, you know, you just pouring your thoughts and stuff down onto the paper. So Vinnie Dunn is known by probably a smaller group of people, but just as important as an instructor's instructor, an instructor's assistant. He's a, he has helped put a lot of guys on the road to teaching and, and traveling and, and giving lectures and writing articles too. So Vinnie Dunn has a sort of multifaceted, uh, you know, history. Well, and, and internationally known, and I was kind of leading, you know, towards that. And I'm, I'm glad you, I, you, you brought Vinny back into it to talk about just that. I, I always, you, you always find me talking about Bill Allen. Bill Allen was my Lieutenant in Bedford Park. And Bill Allen is the kind of boss, the kind of company officer that you truly don't realize just how great they were, just how great of a boss they were until you were done working for him. Right. Now I knew he was, I knew he was a great boss when I was there, but there's things I go, Oh my God, I wish I could go back in time. Bill Allen made, I'll tell you, had such an impact in my fire service career. And don't get me wrong, he built, it, you know, Bill was one of those guys, John, that, well, he rubbed Rick's shoulders and told me how special it was. There were times he would give me that look. There were times he had a talk with me. There were times he stood me on my head when I needed it. And thank God he did. And, and, and you know, back then, you know, we talked about the other day, I, I wasn't upset that he straightened me out, you know, like some guys get, they get all butthurt over it. I was more disappointed in myself because I felt like it disappointed him, John, because he's mm -hmm. such a great guy. He, he defined what it meant to be a company officer. Mm -hmm. I mean, his leadership ability has meant, you know, he, I could be going through and I was going through a bad time in my life. That guy knew what buttons to push. He knew how to grab me and drag me back over to the right track. 
you know, I remember coming in, I was going through a bad time and I'm, I was all mad and angry. I'm like, just, I, I just want to be left alone and kind of marched off. And you know, a lot of guys that shift and you know, an hour later, we're checking our rigs and sh like shortly right after that, we're laughing and yucking it up. And I'm like, what the hell? And I looked over and he's just standing there and I go, he did it again. He, he knows without me knowing it, how to drag me back in the right direction, push the right buttons to help me re-engage. Right. He knew me. He knew, you know, and he's one of those, he's one of those guys, John, and I talk about this all the time, that made me want to be a better firefighter. Just being around Lieutenant Bill Allen made me want to be a better firefighter. I love that guy. What a great family man. Mm -hmm. What a great, I can remember his wife. I remember his daughter. I remember his son, Mike. I just, you know. And what a great legacy. Think oh. about that. And here it is, decades oh. and decades later, and you're talking about him here on this podcast. You talk about him in the classroom when we do the Company Officer Academy. And so he is still out there, just like we talk about Andy Frederick all the time. He's still teaching people because so many people were, were motivated by him and inspired by him. Same thing with Bill Allen. And, and, the, and there's other Rick Leskies out there. There's other guys that worked on your shift that are, that are out doing different things. And that's the great thing about a legacy. Your legacy is, is, is you living on you know, in the fire service when your actual time there ended, when you retired, moved on to camping or hiking or being and, a grandpa or something. Legacy is not ego. Uh, it's oh, not I, like ego. It's, it's, it's quite. No, because the ego would be self-created. And the right. legacy is created by those around you. That's so right. Yeah, that's what's, that's just so pure about them. That would, and, that's what makes a legacy so valuable. Yeah, and the, co the coolest thing about the guys we're talking about is they had no idea what they were doing. They, they, by meaning legacy wise they no egos just, no, no egos at all they were just good people that want to make a difference in your life and 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 you know we, we mentioned uh uh before tom brennan oh god tom brennan uh, you could walk the hallways with tom brennan and forget about getting anywhere on time right you always had to have handlers because it, because you couldn't go 20 yards without somebody pulling them off the Oh, stopping him. And he always had Stop. time for you. Yep. He always had, for people he just met, guy, you know, Chief Brennan, you got, you got a second. Yeah, what's up, kid? And he's over by the window talking. He's grabbing a cup of coffee talking. He's actually oh, so he's posing with five guys, taking oh. a couple of pictures. And, you know, he always had time to share information and talk to people. And people would walk away going, what a great guy, man. What a great guy. And, and you saw that. With, with 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 Tom Brennan. It was just, you know, I mean, I remember when I first met him, I was I was awestruck and he spent time talking to Rinky Dink, little old putsy Rick Lasky, like like I was somebody special to him. I remember sitting around him like you'd walk in to a conference or be at FDIC or wherever it was in between in the evening, maybe at a restaurant or sitting in a hotel lobby, and you just ha you just happened to stumble in. And there he was sitting there with a couple of guys. And, and a couple of other guys, meaning a couple of instructors that, that you knew, and then a, just a couple of firefighters sitting there, a couple of young officers sitting there talking, and you look, I didn't even get involved. I didn't even walk over there. I'm just watching for a minute or two, and you had to see the look on their faces. These guys were like, you know, 20 minutes later, they said, holy crap, you know who we were with tonight? We were just down in the lobby with Tom Brennan. You heard or hear him talk. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, we, and when we talked earlier about, about doing this podcast, we, we mentioned, like, gee, what, what are some of the legacy? What are some of the impressions? What are some of the things that are living on about Tom, right? And Tom's not only out of the fire service, but, he, but he's passed away. And, and one of the things he always said was, and he said it over and over again in different ways, was this is your fire service. And if you let it go and if you don't stay active in it, they're going to take it away from you. Meaning, you know, some of the other people that have other ideas about what the fire service should be. And, and, and they're always there. You know, every era, every generation has different people that think different things about where we should be going and what we should be doing. And Tom was always one of the old, you know, ax and halligan guys and cut the roof and get in there and put the fire out and make a search. And, you know, he was always one of the, you know, let's call it old school guys, right? I love calling it old school, but it's so true. And that was his legacy. Tom Brennan was an old school fire captain and an old school fire chief up in, up in, Mort up, up in Mortarberry, you know, it was, oh. and, and it was great to have, I'm great to have, I'm, I'm grateful to have known him and, and that they've shared some some fire service time with him. Well, and and if you remember when they used to do Bruno and Brennan Unplugged and they're sitting up on the stage and the question was, if you could say one thing about each other, what would it be? And Alan Bruno Senior, we'll talk, well, this, you had to talk about Bruno here in a second. We're talking about people leaving legacy. Bruno leaned over and said, I wish I could have worked for him. I wish I could have been one of his firefighters. 
Alan Brunacini said about Tom Brennan, right. I wish, I, and Tom Brennan said, I wish I could have worked for him. And Bruno, these two old guys leaned over and kind of tapped him on the on the arm, and I went, that was such a cool moment. Yes. And and like you said, you watched, you watched, and they them. really meant it. Oh, and you, but getting back to like the restaurant, guys sitting around talking, and as he's talking, you can see them look at each other. Like, can you believe we're talking with Tom Brennan? We're sitting with Tom Brennan. Right. We're sitting with it, and 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 it's just the excitement. And you and I've been there. You know, and, you know, we, we talk, oh, uh, uh, John Norman, your good friend, my good friend, John Norman, you know, and I, I've told this story, I need to tell this during uh, uh, After Hours at FDIC, but, um, you know, John and I, we talked together, we, we met, with, I met him when he was uh, a field instructor teaching for the University of Illinois Fire Service Institute, just doing classes, we we're just doing classes, hanging out, and then we start teaching Saving Our Own. Well, right before we did it, when he came out with his first Fire Officer's Handbook of Tactics book. I bought it. I unwrapped it. I was so excited. I think you've heard me tell a story. I was oh, so I excited. Have. We're in the Radisson Hotel, downtown Champaign, Illinois, right on, univer- on, the, on the campus, University of Illinois, the Fire Service Institute. I want to go have John sign it, right? And everybody's in the hallways. Donnie Hayes, Sal Marchese, everybody's, we're goofing and having fun. And I walk all the way down to his room. I say, Johnny, I said, yeah, what's up, Rick? I go, hey, look, love the book. Can I get you to sign it for me? He, oh, yeah, I'd be honored to sign the audience as a gentleman. Yep. Yeah, I'd be honest. And he goes to open. He goes, have you read it? The binder's not even cracked on it yet. I said, yeah, I've read it. It's a great book. He goes, okay. He goes, oh, let me sign. He signs. I said, John, thank you. That was an honor. Thank you. Great book. And I lied. I didn't read it. I just took it out of the, out of the plastic. And I, I'm walking But you down. wanted to secure that, that oh, signature. As soon but as I'm possible. walking down the hallway back to my room. And you know what I think? I'm walking slower and slower. And I'm kind of slunking down. And then I just made a U-turn. I walked all the way back to his room. I said, John, he goes, yeah, I said, I lied. I didn't read it yet. I, I panicked. I don't know what to say. I wanted you to sign it so bad. He started laughing. I'm like, I just lied to my one of my mentors. Oh, and, and man, I'd be a so very good funny, friend. Huh? But you're an honest man. You went back oh, and told God, him. Oh, God, I couldn't. I was like, I can't believe I just did it. didn't bother him at all, I'm sure. I'm well, sure he was happy to hear talk, that. Talk about his legacy. Now, we've talked about Ray Downey plenty, a mentor to both of us. I, I miss him taking from us on 9-11. John spent a lot of his time in SOC. Absolutely. John spent, John spent every rank in SOC until he made staff chief. Well, and, and then when he was a battalion chief in um, Brooklyn, right? Mm-hmm. And then deputy, and then we lost Ray on 9-11. They and slid they, him over to take over right SOC. Yep. And, and that was without the keychain, without the keys. He yeah. just they said, here you go. And he was take a fireman in Rescue 3. Time. He was Lieutenant Rescue Two. He was a Captain of Rescue One. Talk about, talk about a history. Talk about a, you know, I mean, talk about a guy that's that's got a, a SOC, Special Operations Command, uh, you know, history oh, of the FDNY. And, and coming know. in after 9-11 to take over for Ray. Right. Um, um, I mean, oh my God. Not it many just, people can say they took over for Ray Downey, right? Oh, oh my God. But th- let's do this before, because I, I, all these names keep popping into my head. I know it's you. You mentioned something uh, the other day we were talking about Bruno and about the impact and what people do and so on and so forth. And, and Alan Brunacini, um, oh, my God, 48 years in Phoenix, 26 as the chief, the, the father of the incident command system, if you will, took what they were doing in the wildland and, and adapted it to structural fires. Um, uh, customer service, father, the only fire chief to have his picture on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. His customer service program, and then NFPA 15, and all his contributions that he did. But probably one of the coolest ones, and you mentioned, were two words that you can see on a little bumper sticker about how you should treat people. Very simple phrase that you see everywhere. It was be nice, be nice, be nice, be nice. And and, and, and I got to tell you, and you've heard me say this before. You know, I I was not on the same frequency as Alan Brunacini in my younger years. You know what I'm saying? Now, now listen, he, he's, you know, in years, he's way ahead of me in years, right? A, a, an older man than me, is practically a generation ahead of me, right? Um, and, and like I said, we weren't on the same frequency in a lot of things, including be nice. I'm saying to myself, be nice? What is he talking about? I'm smoking a cigar. I got my leather helmet. I'm a lieutenant squad one. I'm thinking about fighting fires and making rescues. And who's this old dude thinking about, what, what the hell does be nice have to do with anything, you know? And I must tell you, I must tell you, as the years have gone on, 
And I've and as I've grown in the fire service, and I've grown as a man, as my family has grown, and as, as things have happened in our own personal lives, everybody over the years, I've come to realize that be nice might be one of the most valuable and valid things that he ever proposed, even above and beyond stuff like the incident command system. You know what I'm saying? Like, be, talk about something that spans everything. It spans the fire service. It spans life. It spans families. It spans everything. And my goodness, isn't be nice. You know, it really is something very important. And, and I've learned a lot of lessons from Alan Brunacini that, that I rejected earlier in my career that I have since embraced. And, you know, of course, Alan is gone now too. And it's so true with a, with a lot of people that some, some people's legacy ends up teaching more to future generations than, it, than they did maybe to the generations that were around when they were alive, you know? Well, kind of like when we talk about Andy Fredericks, like you said before, Andy's still teaching today. Bruno, that whole be nice thing, it's almost like when you tell someone they're getting ready to spew out some evil. It's like you tell them, go with God. You know, just do the right thing. Don't, sh you know, be nice. And, and like you said, how, I mean, it was just, and, and uh, uh, same thing. When he first came out as customer service, I said, you want me to what? You want me to do what before I actually tear the rest of that wall? You want me to, you finish the guy's driveway and, and, what, where's that in the job description being a firefighter? Right, right. And then what do my guys do? They finish the guys, they finish sod and lay sod and the whole, we make Reader's Digest because Mark Lee and his crew went back after they took a guy to the hospital with the ambulance for chest pains, having a heart attack, the truck company goes back there, lays all the sod, you know, cleans up, put the tools away, put yep. the kids' toys away, come in their landscape because a lot more, mow the backyard, come back and don't tell nobody. This guy gets better and finds out what he did. He calls the governor, calls the president, he calls Reader's Digest, Reader's Digest does a story called a sad story, not a sad story, how firefighters do more than just fight fires. I carried that mag for a year. I carried that magazine. Amazing story. Just so many nice. others. There's stories about guys that finished a haircut for the barber that had the heart attack, right? And then they oh, finished yeah. a haircut in, in, a, in a barber shop for a guy. And again, like you said, the concrete, finished finish putting the concrete patio in or whatever it was. All tremendous Never heard of before concepts. Never heard of before. Not even uttered by anybody. And also, there's Bruno Cini talking about them on stage and promoting them. Like, and obviously, they didn't fit into everybody's everybody's world, everybody's fire service existence. Right. But but in the places where they did, they flourished. And 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 the places where they didn't, maybe five years later, maybe people started to come up with some other ideas of how to be nice and how to be more helpful and how to help Mrs. Smith and and concepts like that that are. I mean, nationally and internationally recognized and standards for the fire service, Mrs. Smith, taking care of Mrs. Smith. Everybody knows what that means. And, and I, have, I have lost track of how many times we, we have said in class, especially you, you, we're all here and we exist because of them, to serve them, the public. public we're public servants. You ever say the moment you screw the fire helmet to your head, right. you became a public servant. In that Mrs. Smith, and that's what he was talking about. I that's took offense, right. like, Mrs. Smith, I'm a firefighter. You know, I'm on a truck. I'm supposed to, you know, and, you know, you can still do it. He, you know what he said? He goes, Rick, you can still go do all that stuff. You can still cut holes in the roof. You can, you, you can still, you know, pull sheetrock. You can still fight fire. Just be nice while you're doing it. And you, and know. you know, and you know, Mrs. Smith, think about this. Mrs. Smith is them. Yeah, that's who he was talking about. Yeah. He just didn't say them. He said Mrs. Smith, and 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 you realize that and you say, oh my goodness, he, face he had face. this concept thirty years yeah. ago. Thirty years ago, he was talking about them. Let's take care of Mrs. Smith. He meant let's take care of the public. Let's take care of our customers. Let's take care of the people out there that we're here to get paid or volunteer to help. And he was so so right. Well, and shift gears for a moment because, and not that he was not nice. He was not that he was not nice. I'm not talking about that. But I'm thinking somebody's coming to mind right now who was a legendary captain in the FDNY. Um, they posted in his memory three years since his death a uh, picture of him with medals, the Ray Downey kind of medals that just, right. you said like Mickey Cowboy has, medals down to like their belt on their Absolutely, their absolutely. And, and, and again, not that he wasn't nice, but man, he could be a, a tough captain to work for if you weren't into the job because he loved the job so much. And that was, that was, that was John Vigiano, Captain Vigiano. And you, I want you, you've said it before, but it's worth saying again, tell the story about how, just get, how did he believe, you talk about legacy. 
his legacy went. So talk about him and who he was and his family first and his legacy behind being the, the captain of the truck crew, the captain of the company, and how he tuned his guys up through training to make sure they were the best. Right. Talk about his family. Well, first, John was a, you know, he was a rescue two legend, as, as most guys in rescue two are. It was just a historically busy and, and dedicated, uh, you know, fire company that, that just performed extraordinarily across the board, every rank, firefighters, lieutenants, my, my, one of my idols, you know, Pete London was my Lieutenant Rescue 3, ended up as a Lieutenant Rescue 2, where, you know, he went back to where he had been a firefighter, and that's where he retired from. But back to Rescue 2, it's just a historical place that, you know, and, and Brooklyn, historically very busy fire-wise place. So, it was, so not only were they, did they have the right attitude and passion for the job, but, but they had a plate full of fire, man. Every day they went to work, there was just fires, fires, fires there in Brooklyn and all sorts of different neighborhoods. Now, John Vigiano was, was, was there, you know. John Vigiano was, was a Marine, right? So he had, he had discipline, he had structure. And John Vigiano had two boys. One of his boys was on the job at the NY, the truck company. And his other boy was, a, was an NYPD uh, police officer assigned to ESU, which is, again, the equivalent of, you know, the, the FDMY rescue companies. And uh, emergency services unit, right? Emergency service, ESU, correct. And John lost both his boys, both his boys on 9 11 oh, on the same boy. day. They were both there operating one is an ESU cop, one is as, as a firefighter in the FDMY, and they were both lost. I, re I remember being there to this day, I'll never forget it. Uh, a lot of images that, that, that'll never leave me. And one of them was John Vigiano standing there with his turnout coat on. I saw him, I, I you know, countless days. I can't tell you how many days he was there. He was there, I mean, every day that I saw him there. He, he was there every day that I was there, you know, I'm sure every day in between as well. Uh, just a dramatic, really dedicated FDNY firefighter, fire officer, lieutenant, and captain. So, so the, the story you mentioned is John, John makes captain. And I must say, unlike lots of guys in SOP, special operations and the rescue companies, you know, a lot of guys went back like John Norman, firefighter rescue three, lieutenant rescue two, a firefighter rescue, a captain rescue one. John Vigiano was, was a lieutenant rescue two. But when he made captain, he, he was a captain of 176 truck, a, a historic truck company in Brooklyn, very well known for being busy and having good squared away people, senior firefighters, firefighters that are there for decades. And, and now, De now I must decades, decades. <laughs> now I must, I must tell you, and I hope it doesn't ruin the story, but I must tell you that I, that, that this is a, a, such a great story and I can only hope that it's true and I'm sure that it's true, but I can't tell you for sure that, you know, somebody told me that says, yeah, I was there when it happened and I know what happened, but I, but I love the story because of the lesson that it teaches. And the lesson was that, you know, a couple or one of the senior guys came to him one day and said, hey, Captain, we got to talk a little bit about something. And, you know, he was maybe not the new captain there anymore, but he'd been there for a while and established himself. And, and John Vigiano was always about training. They were training all the time. John Vigiano was in the rescue. The rescue used to sort of roam around Brooklyn. They didn't just sit in the firehouse waiting for runners. They would roam around. They'd be driving around Brownsville or bed wherever they thought, gee, there's been a couple of jobs here this week. Let's roam around here. And they, and they, would get, they, were, they were hunting for work. They were hunting for fires. They really were. And John just loved training, and they did all sorts of training there. And that was the captain of 176 truck with a, with a senior crew and, you know, probably some, some, some medium, mid-level guys and maybe some young people too. But um, – Guy comes to him. One of the senior guys came and said, listen, you know, the, the training is fantastic. We love you. You're a great captain. And, uh, uh, you know, we would, you know, th that has to be clear that, that we love, we love everything. We love the training. We love everything. We love the way you lead the company. And we just want to let you know that, you know, a couple of guys, a couple of the senior guys, like just going out at midnight stuff and going out in the middle of the winter <laughs> at two degrees and stuff like that. Sometimes it gets, you know, some of the guys are a little, you know, it's getting a little old for some of the guys. We love, we're not saying we don't want to train, but, you know, some of the late night stuff and some of the two hour drills and some of the more extreme, let's say, events right, right. are just uh, a little much for some of the guys. And I, we don't mean anything by it, but I just want to let you know. And, okay, thank you very much. And I'm, great, I'm glad we had, a, you know, an opportunity to talk. You know, and then, and then, the, then the story goes that, you know, an hour or two later, he shows up down on the upright floor, or, you know, 176 truck roll call at the upright floor. They all come down and he's like, listen. I, I spoke to you guys earlier. One of you guys came up to the office and we spoke earlier. And uh, uh, I understand that some of you guys are senior members, you know, 20, 30 years on a job. You, you're looking maybe to not, you know, train as hard or as long or as under adverse conditions as we're doing. And, and I, 
I fully, fully, fully understand that, guys. I, I like working with you guys, too. I love 176 trucks. So so I've taken the opportunity to fill out some transfer papers for all of you. <laughs> and, and here they are. And, you know, just put in a company that you want to go to, and I'll make sure you get there and no hard feelings at all. And then disappear back up to the <laughs> office. And, and, and I just hope it's true because it just shows such gusto. It just shows such what we teach in our company, Officer Academy, such courage. He was not afraid to say to his favorite, most senior, hardworking, dedicated guys, hey, listen, here's how we're doing it. I'm the captain. And if you don't like it, you know, there's probably other places where you can go that, that you'd be more comfortable, you know? And, and, and John was just a great guy. And, and, and if it's not true, it's still a great story about, about how you can feel about what you're doing. John was always doing what he thought was the right thing to do, you know? Well, and, and again, another, another person who didn't set out to leave their legacy. None of these guys we've talked about set out to leave a legacy. They did it because they're good people, great people, great mentors, and just want to make a I difference. I went to John Vigiano's funeral out in Long Island, and there were thousands of people there. Wow. It was, it was, it was quite unbelievable. He was, uh, he was quite a guy. Well, and, you know, whether it's a, a Tommy Trevino, you've heard me talk about Tommy, retired from Oakland, Illinois. One of my instructors, one of my good friends, just God, what a good, what a, what a, what a good guy. And his energy and and watching students feed off his energy as an instructor, you know, they wanted to be like Tommy. They went Eddie Enright and Jack McCaslin. You heard me talk about them, Chief Eddie Enright from Chicago and Chief Jack McCaslin. You know, uh, Eddie, a soldier with the First Infantry, with the, the big red one from the from the United States Army, and Mac, a Marine, and and. They had a booster tank full of classes. I mean, you could just take a nozzle, open up, and classes just shot out the head. But one of the, the greatest classes they had was what they called duty, pride, and honor. And it was like, oh, my God. It was just you sat there. You wanted to run up a hill with a rifle after you're done with those, with those two. You know, and, and two different mannerisms. You know, two different – Eddie was kind of, you know, you know, more laid back. Mac was more hard-charging, you know, and all that stuff. And I remember Jay Coon, remember Jay Coon from Saturday Captain well. Jay well. Coon, he called me once. He goes, hey, Rick, brother, there's these two old guys out here that are teaching your stuff. They're teaching pride, pride. I said, what? He goes, well, let me get the flyer. They're teaching pr your pride stuff. And it's just, I want to let you know they're, they're ripping off your stuff. And I go, what is? He goes, well, it, it, it's, 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 it's two old, old guys. Uh, uh, what is it? Ed Enright and Jack McCassin are teaching duty, pride, honor. I said, holy crap, Jay. I go, they're, they're the reason there is pride and ownership. I said, that's a different program, but oh my God, look at my pride and ownership book. They're both featured. They mean so much to me and to the whole pride and ownership deal that there, there is a whole section on each one of them in my story. book. What a great story. And he story. goes, oh, he goes, well, I, then I'm going to that class. I said, oh God, if I was there, I'd go through the class. And I've sat through it like 10 times. I go, they're the reason. I go, you should have everybody in the Sacramento, City of Sacramento Fire Department attending. And, and, and again, Rick, talk about legacy. Holy cow. That, that is the definition. That little story you just told is the definition of legacy, right? Hey, these old two old guys are doing your stuff. No, man, I, that's where I got my stuff, right? Isn't that yeah. wonderful? Who was it? Which of those two was it that you were riding with? And he was like, yeah, we, oh, got, we got jumpers. Eddie. We got jumpers. Oh, Eddie. Eddie would, you know, Mac, Mac Mac's the one. That, that taught me. He's the one that said, Ricky, you want to, when I was 18 years old, you want to be a good firefighter? You need to know building construction, he did with his thumb and his finger. You need, you need to know building construction, fire behavior. He goes, you got to understand what the building's going to do with the fire, and the fire's going to do with the building. Otherwise, you just guess it. Now, this is a combat veteran Marine from Vietnam that should be dead for what he went through as a Marine, you know. And, he, and I just would live on his word. I'd watch him teach. I could actually imitate him. You know, I'd get, my, I'd get a pair of glasses, pull my nose, like he would walk around the class, a little cup of coffee, a little cup of coffee. He'd start off the class, he'd kind of wander, look around, go, yeah, man. And he would talk like, yeah, my name's Jack McCaslin. My friends call me Mac. Uh, today we're going to talk about tactics and strategy and llama damas and uh, bat belts and all this kind of stuff and all that. And he, he came up to me once. He goes, hey, I heard you do me. I go, no. She goes, no, no, I heard you do me. Do it right now. I go, I can't do it right now because I'm scared. <laughs> but but he, he's going to talk me that. And, and, and we've heard me say it so many times, boiling water in the, in the paper cup. Oh, God, what when a that, great story. When that kid set himself on fire with gasoline in the water bed, I couldn't understand why the water bed put out the fire. Long story short, if you've been, if you've been through my, my, my Pride and Ocean class attack that I've talked about, the fact that you could boil water in a paper cup with flames 
and not burn a cup. It, it, it just, it, God, Mac had that way. Eddie's the one. Eddie's, everything was a teaching moment to Eddie. You'd be in it. When I was in the third battalion, he, he retired from as a deputy district chief. Uh, that that would be a deputy job in District 1. He was a high-rise guru. He was originally, you know, he was a captain at Engine 98. His dad was down at 202 Chicago next to the Hancock building. That's, that's I've been the, in that slide. That's the problem with the, the stained glass windows. Looks like the water tower. Eddie, Eddie was an old snorkel squad one guy, the old SS1 guys in the days, man. Oh, my God. He was, oh, and if he get those those Irish legs going, those big legs, you could keep up with him. And he was always the kindest, sweetest, was a gentleman. Unless I, a couple of times I heard people get a yo pal. You didn't want a yo pal from him. But so you, what you're saying, we're in the third battalion. He's in battalion three. And we're driving on Chicago Avenue, making rounds. And all of a sudden, he just stops in the lane, turns on his flashers on his light bar, goes, Rick. Third, third, see that three, three, third, third building, third, third house, a three-story frame. Third, there, third one down. Top floor fire, backside of the building. How much hose you need? I'm like, we're, we're in the middle of the street. Yeah, 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 yeah. How much hose you need? I'm like, well, um, you know, my, either my bumper's going to be there, my tailboard's going to be there. I got to leave room for the truck. It's probably 75 feet to the door. You've always taught me one length per landing, roughly. I, yeah, I can get it with my with my my 200 foot pre-connect, my cross up. Everything was a teaching moment to him. You know, he's the one, Rick, you know, before you, before you charge this, you know, before you charge the hydrant, we have got a sprinkler building and we have a fire, be, you know, charge the system. But before you actually open your intake, your hydrant's charged to the rig, you know, you you got a good solid, your LDH is charged to the rig, no problem. Don't open it yet. Charge the system with your tank water, watch your tank levels. He goes, if, if, not, if, if we have smoke and a lot of smoke and you don't lose any water, you need to let, you need to let me know. Because that means those heads aren't going, or it's not smoke, off whatever. Yeah. yeah. Or if you also bink a little up, bink, we might have multiple heads off. He goes, and then you can open up your. It, the guy had more, you more know, little tricks of the trade. Winter, Rick, don't circulate your pump as soon as you get to the scene, because you're circulating freezing cold water. Put it in pump. Let the pump water heat up. Put your hand on the intake, and when you start to feel it get warm. Now circuit because now you're circulating warm water to the pump. I'm like the guy, I could go on and on, and he's the one. You're walking on the street, and he's and 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 you're like, I'm filming. I got my video, and he's like, he's like, you know, and, and that was just that was just him with the whole, you know, hey hey hey, look, Rick, we got jumpers. It was like no big deal. And you know what's so wonderful about this? I'm sitting here listening to you and watching you, and it's him. You know what I'm saying? Talk about legacy. He's living. You know, through you, your, his message is still going through you, just like you mentioned about Andy before. It's so great that we both have had the opportunity to work with and talk with and learn from some of the greats in the fire departments that we've been in or that we've been hanging around oh. with or became friendly with. And and now we're continuing to pass that stuff on to, to other groups of people on the next generation. All the, all the stories, the difference between a off, uh, working officer and you know, one who had a lucky Saturday. And every time we go to district headquarters, we have to go back to quarters because he always put his tie up. Right. You don't go to district headquarters, watch your time. Just, there were so many things, and I'm sitting here thinking about all the people, you know, that, that we just talked about and the impact they had. And I'm, I'm going to speak selfishly for a moment here. The impact they had on my life. I know what they did for you, but, oh, my God, the impact they had on my life. You know, I remember telling Tom Freeman, I think, John, we don't tell our mentors enough how much they mean to us. Yep. Or we realize it too late. Yep. All right. And I remember Tom Freeman, Chief Tom Freeman, another one. There's a whole section of him in my book. He's in our leadership book, too. I, I did a class at Illinois Fire Protection Districts. Great, great. Sherry runs a great organization in Illinois. And he goes, yeah, I'll drive you back to the airport, Peoria, Illinois. So we pull up. He's in his old, his Crown Vic. And I go to get out of the car at the airport. I reach back. I got one foot out the door. I'm going to shake his hand. I shook his hand. I said, I said, thank you. I called him 500. I was his radio signature back. He was on uh, Woodward. He's with Elmhurst now. I was 606 or 161. I said, I said, I said, thanks, five, but he goes, yeah, no problem, six, oh, six, you know, and I held on to his hand as I was getting back, and I said, thanks, buddy. He goes, for what? I go, for everything. He goes, what do you mean? I go, you have no idea. I would not be where I'm at today if it wasn't for you, and I've never thanked you, and I looked up, and he, and this is, this guy's pretty tough, and his eyes, he started tearing about, oh, God, I don't want you to cry, but I'm like, I'm so glad he's still, he's still chiefing it. There's people I wish in my life I had taken the time mm -hmm. to say, 
thanks for everything you've done for me. You know what I'm saying? And I'll never let that escape me again. You know, to let a mentor, a person, someone, you, you know, that, that their legacy affected my life. And I must tell you, and you know the no, you know the name Joe Callen. Oh, Joe yeah. Callen was a, was a, he was the Bur uh, Bronx Borough Commander when he retired. Uh, he was a deputy chief for many of the years when I was a young, brand new battalion chief. When I was a captain of study and he was a battalion and a deputy. And <clears throat> I had such tremendous respect for him. He was, he was a, he was a, very much like, in lots of ways, Jay Jonas, or let's say Jay was very much like him. I think Jay and I learned a lot from him. We used to listen to him studying in the program we used to go to. We used to pay to go prepare for civil service exams. He was one of the instructors, and we later became instructors in that same company. And my point is I loved working with Joe Callan. I thought he was one of the most squared away, critical thinking. Um, you know, he, he had a reason for everything he did. He had a standard that he bent for no one, that he bent for no one. He was the guy that would be walking away from a third alarm that went under control. And as he walked past an engine down the block that wasn't parked on a hydrant, he would ask the engineer, the chauffeur, why are you parked here? Why, why aren't you on a hydrant where you could possibly do something if your services are needed? You know what I'm saying? And, and I must tell you, if I have done it once, I've done it a couple of times, I've considered, you know, contacting one of his two sons who are both now battalion chiefs on the job and saying, give, give me your dad's phone number. I got to give him a call. I would just love to call Joe Cowell and say, hey, hey, Chief, this is John Soft. I'm retired 10 years out now. of the blue. And I just got to thank you. I'm retired 10 years, and I still thank God that I met you and worked with you. You had such a positive impact on my career, and, you know, in the FDNY, the way I did things, the way I thought, the way I studied. And I just want to say thank you to you, you know, and let you know that I don't know how many other people have said it, but, but I appreciate it, you know. And, and someday I may do it, maybe even – Maybe even this conversation will, will spur me to do that. You know, you should, because like I said, there's a couple of people that are now gone. You know, I got to tell Alan Brunacini. I got to tell Tom Brennan. Right. Especially after 9-11, when I realized in a blink, first of all, we've all had friends that have been, you know, you and I have had friends that have been killed in line of duty. But in the blink of an eye, you, it's like my chance is gone. I'll never be able to say it. I mean, I can talk to the sky all I want, but I want to be able to look you right. in the eye You're right. and shake your hand and tell – even Mrs. Humphreys, my fifth grade teacher, you heard me talk about her. She looked like the crib keeper, but she changed my life. And she was sweet. She was very good. She was tough, but she yeah. was, she changed. She believed in me as a kid. And so anyway, I just, you know, I guess, I guess the lesson there is John, um, be a mentor, make a difference in someone's life. You don't set out to leave your legacy. You do it by being a good person. You do it by working hard you do it by being involved, by being interested in the job, and being being into the job, and by trying to make a difference in other people's lives. Yeah. And it just happens naturally, right? Absolutely, it follows you. It just follows you up. It's something that's that being being built around you by others, you know, which is great. God, another, another, what a great topic! Another great topic. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I was a little doubtful about talking about legacy, thinking about gee, what are we going to talk about? And boy, did this conversation oh. just evolve into a really great one. It was great. So, hey, to our to our to our wonderful listeners, uh, to the, to our friends, what are you doing? What are you, what are you doing? You know, what will be your legacy? What, what when you leave? What will they say about you? Um, what what difference will you have made? How will you have impacted? People? Look, first of all, you impacted people's lives just by serving as a firefighter. But what would you have done even beyond that in, in the people around you? Um, Absolutely. What a great topic. Hey, Absolutely. email email email. Chief John Salka at gmail.com. And I'm Chief Lasky at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, we end all of our episodes uh, asking you to please keep the men and women of armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. We love you. We hope to see you at one of our conferences, one of our programs real soon. If not, in the meantime, be careful, be safe. We love you. God bless you.